<clears throat> well, it looks like we're getting up to critical mass, so I guess we can start. Um, again, I'm James Cliff, Deputy Director of the Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy. Um, Lisa will not be able to join us today. Unfortunately, our state of family matter come up. Um, so I am going to take us through kind of some of our the business portion of our meeting. Um, and then Corey will kind of walk you through the rest of the agenda. Unfortunately, I have a, a conflict. I'll have to step out. I'm hoping to rejoin you a little later. Um, we are in our sixth meeting of 2022, our 20th overall meeting. Um, last council meeting was Tuesday, September 27th. Um, included in today's packet was the proposed dates for 2023. Um, they have been sent to everyone for your review. And we will approve them in a few minutes after we get through some of the other items. But um, again, it is uh, basically um, I think kind of the was it fourth Tuesday or whatever of, of, of uh, quarterly through the year there. Um, so first we'll run through the attendance and then we'll go ahead with approval of the minutes and the, uh, the uh, council agenda. Uh, so let's see, Paul Edgebo. Or is alternative Niles? Uh, Frank Beaver. He's going to say present because he's here in the room with us. Uh, uh, Susan Corbin or Judd at either. Uh, uh, Carrie Dugan. Present boss. Gary. Uh, Dan Eichinger or Scott Whitcomb. Uh, let's see, Rachel Eubanks or Larry, either of them join us. Uh, Jim Harrison. Present. Frank, I have given the steps. Thanks, Jim. Um, Elizabeth Hertel or Megan with us. Megan's here. Hi, Megan. Uh, Brandon Hoffmaster. I'm here on Teams. Uh, Marnice Jackson. Present. Hi, Marnice. Uh, Kevin Polvar. Uh, Gary McDowell. Here. Here. You. Uh, Phyllis Meadows. Britton Messer or Steve Bacall? Steve's here. Steve? Uh, let's see, Jonathan Overpeck, I don't believe he's going to be with us today. Uh, Tanya? Here. And he's here with us. Phil Roos? Here. Hi, everybody. Phil? Uh, Dan Scripps? I'm here, James. Daryl Slaughter? Here. Well, good to see you. Uh, Sam Stokler. Hi, James. Hi, everyone. Uh, Ronald Vogler. Yeah, Ron Vogler's here. And Cynthia Williams. Cynthia's online. Thanks. Uh, looks like we have a forum here to uh, proceed with business. Um, so start with adoption of the agenda. A uh, draft agenda was sent to all the council members on uh, November 22nd. Uh, we have a, a motion and a second to adopt the agenda. Okay. Right. Okay. Right. moved. Jim seconded. All in favor say aye. Aye. Those aye. opposed? Aye. 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 Uh, and the uh, agenda is adopted. Uh, now we're going to go ahead with approval of the September 27th meeting minutes. Uh, draft minutes were sent to the council members on November 23rd. Uh, do I have a motion and a second? So moved. Okay. Second. Okay. Well, moved. Yep. Time second. Um, all right. Um, all in favor, say aye. 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 Going to pause here on the second one. <laughs> those those opposed, the same. Uh, the uh, minutes are adopted. 
Uh, lastly, we need to approve the meeting date for the 2023 council meetings. Um, they were included in a packet sent to on the 22nd. We have uh, February 28th, May 23rd, August 22nd, and November 28th. Um, can I get a uh, motion to adopt those as our meeting dates? Mm -hmm. Jim moves, second. Second. And I think that was uh, something like that. Dan, yeah. Um, uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Uh, the dates are adopted. Uh, thank you very much. That's my, you know, critical portion of the meeting here. Um, again, I'm going to stick around for a couple of minutes, but then uh, Corey is going to walk us through the rest of the agenda. Over. All right. Hey, everyone. Um, I'll try to make sure I speak up. I tend to sometimes mumble on these things. I'm uh, very happy to be here today. Uh, excited to, to get through this. And uh, unlike the last time where you had to listen to me speak kind of ad nauseum, uh, we tried to make this a little bit more interactive today. And I'm going to try to get through the updates from our office, our supply and energy, relatively quickly. Um, obviously open to questions as we go, but with the intention to get to our presenters today. So what you can expect, James just walked us through the welcome in a bit in the business. I'm going to provide a few updates. Um, we're going to get a midterm election overview at the federal level and federal landscape on inflection, inflation reduction act. I've had a lot of coffee and not a lot of sleep, so all of these are um, really simple pronunciation issues. Um, so we'll get that from the Great Plains Institute and Doug Scott, we all are familiar with. Uh, and then leading from that, we'll go to kind of leading directly into a presentation from Arnex Energy, uh, a company with the, had a big announcement around the battery manufacturing facility here in Michigan. Um, it is it is an example of some of the types of investments and in, that in, we're going to see more and more of uh, through some of these federal uh, initiatives. Then we're going to go to a uh, round robin for the council members. So get ready to be called on by by the fearless Doug Scott uh, for project spotlights and updates on the work that you all have been doing um, this year as it relates to helping implement the My Health Climate Plan and areas for collaboration and looking forward to 2023. So uh, and I have a couple of follow up questions on that. Um, may have helped me get through that, but I'm hopeful that will be a kind of robust opportunity to hear from all the other council members and, and identify areas for collaboration uh, well beyond just what we can do here at the Office of Planning and Energy. So that's the, the agenda for today. Uh, my remarks, I'm going to try and keep brief. I'm going to give you all a quick. Um, couple of thoughts on on perspective and context since our last meeting. This was actually a briefer uh, a period in between meetings. We only did about two months this time, so probably a little bit less to update on. Uh, and then I'm going to walk through a couple of uh, progress pieces uh, internally here to the state of Michigan. Um, a little bit on some of our efforts on federal funding that I don't think Doug will touch on directly, but I want to flag for folks including the upcoming, upcoming opportunity for engagement and a couple of others. A uh, little bit on some of the work we've been doing to make sure we engage with external stakeholders uh, from also climate and energy, and then a uh, flag on um, our climate conference and an ask around our climate conference. Um, so I'll share a little bit more information about that. So to dig in uh, and make sure I'm, I'm staying on track. Uh, so to dig into this, uh, the big, the updates I wanted to share internal to what we've been doing at Eagle um, and also climate energy. I shared last time that we've been meeting with, we're, we're really taking it to heart that we need to figure out how to mobilize state government resources around the my health and climate plan. And in a lot of ways that starts right here at home at Eagle and working with the various divisions and offices within Eagle. So we have um, been convening over the last, since the release of the climate plan, um, meetings uh, with one to three representatives from each division and office. So that's 15 total offices and divisions within Eagle, um, including ours, uh, and then a couple of representatives, a couple of those offices and a couple of people. 
um, since maybe 2025 folks, and those folks are the climate liaisons to every division and office and, and help get us coverage into every program that they, will, they can touch on helping my final climate plan. So over the last um, several months, we've been doing presentations from each division and office on how their work ties to my health climate plan and can be leveraged to help us implement. Uh, and then each office and division provided a memo that included things that they've been working on that tied to it, things that they think are within their control to, to expand their work uh, moving forward and highlight projects. So um, those a lot of those highlighted projects will be included in our annual report, which I'll touch on in a second. Um, but that is as we get through kind of the taking stock piece of the climate liaison work, we're going to be moving more toward what can we all do today together as a unified department on the plan and my health and plan. Um, and for me, I shared this last time and I, I get cheesy with it, but it is actually like my favorite meeting of the month just because it's a whole bunch of folks that are actually like deeply passionate about these issues and don't always get to work on them doing their day to day job or work production. But it takes a certain amount of time to it. And so we've seen a lot of really interesting creative ideas, a lot of energy around it. And I'm really excited to keep that moving forward. So um, we'll expect to have more updates from that as uh, we've already seen a number of really great ideas for collaboration about that. Um, and the number of topics that folks want to address and work together on in the new year is already uh, exceeding the amount of time we have blocked for them in our monthly meeting. So um, we should have more to report on that. But Wanted to make sure folks kind of have a little bit of a lens into that. Um, that work is also deeply informing our um, the development of our annual report that we will provide to the governor uh, before the end of the year. That's due before the end of the year. Uh, we are in the throes of working on that. Sarah Hutchinson from our team has been nonstop working on that um, and uh, gathering uh, relevant. Uh, data and information to, to share relative to various sections of the climate plan, and then also pulling together highlights from some of the work internal and state government. Um, and we would welcome if if members of the council have particular projects or initiatives that you've undertaken or been a part of that you'd like to see highlighted. Um, no guarantees on what we finally include. We're trying to keep it relatively brief um, and and keep it to the to the point, but. We'd love to, if folks have things that they think are really worth uplifting in terms of the, the effort that we are all taking as a council and as a state, as the entire state, uh, working toward the implementation of climate plan. So we will have that report done before the end of the year, um, and you all will be notified before it goes out and get a copy of that. Uh, and we will be providing it publicly on the website. So um, that is that. Those are the major kind of internal pieces. Now I want to hit on a couple of federal funding things just to give you all a little bit of taste of what we've been working on and some of the opportunities for engagement coming up um, that we think are particularly right for helping implement the climate plan. Uh, and, and, and Doug Scott will talk a little you know, a bit more in detail later. But um, the two big buckets, there, there are lots of ways you could break down the federal funding and there are lots of different ways that it can influence uh, our implementation of my climate plan across the six sections of the plan. Um, but it's sometimes easy to think about it based on source. So uh, we've been really focused on uh, maximizing uh, applications for formula funding, competitive funding, and otherwise around the BIL, the bipartisan infrastructure law, um, and the or IIJA, the Infrastructure Investment Jobs Act, um, which are, those are. Those are the same thing. Uh, I think my favorite, my favorite um, thing that somebody told me the other day is that they are calling it Uncle Ira and Uncle Bill, which makes it makes it easier for me to remember the two packages. But um, on the bipartisan infrastructure law, uh, we are following a number of opportunities. Great Plains Institute. Uh, we have an additional relationship with Great Plains where they're helping us track pretty much anything and everything coming through. Announced that DOE, EPA, and otherwise coming through IRJA, and we're starting to expand that work to IRA. Um, and that helps inform um, our process at EGLE and then across uh, other departments here in the state of Michigan as well. And, and it helps us track uh, in coordination with the Michigan Infrastructure Office. Um, so, a couple of the things that, that are worth highlighting that, that are coming up um, 
There are a number of grid resilience funding opportunities, one of which uh, we have been working, the Michigan Public Service Commission and Eagle have been working in and together to submit an application for that, and that is uh, underway and, and should be submitted shortly. And there have been public engagement opportunities around that that I hope folks have been able to, to see and engage where you'd like. Um, tomorrow, we have a grid resilience I wrote it down because I keep forgetting. I call everything by an acronym, and then I forget what they actually mean. Grid resilience and innovation partnership. So there are three federal, three funding opportunities through BIL that are associated under that under that banner. Um, tomorrow morning at 9 a.m., we will have an information session webinar hosted by uh, Public Service Commission, Eagle, and Great Plains Institute to go over the three funding opportunities underneath that. Um, and to, to try and identify two of those opportunities are not things that the state of Michigan could be, uh, and one of them is something that could potentially be done. Um, so that the intention of that call tomorrow is to identify opportunities for collaboration among stakeholders around the two that are not state-led, and then to identify whether there's um, the, the, the one that could be state-led requires a uh, very significant public-private partnership in terms of match requirements. And so, uh, we want to understand what the applicants. So, for folks that are particularly interested in those opportunities, that'll be that. That's tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Um, we need to make sure we get, get any information out. Um, maybe we can try to make sure and share that link um, later in the fall. And, and Doug will probably have some more information. So, that's some of the items on IJ BIL. Some of the other opportunities to engage on that particular stream of funding. Uh, is actually some of the most likely and really impactful ways that, that folks can engage. It's actually going to be around the formula related to dollars. So the Energy Efficiency Conservation Block Grants, the state energy program dollars, state energy uh, program dollars are going in shortly. A lot of that's going to go towards supporting our work with Catalyst communities and toward workforce. But there will be opportunities for public input on a number of formula opportunities as we put out all of these all those. Um, so those will be be really great opportunities to those are funds that we know we're getting and then there will be an opportunity for, for stakeholders and, and the public to provide input on um, how we actually spend the money that we know we're getting. Uh, so those are a couple of opportunities. We'll continue to flag those for folks. That's on IIJ BIL. Um, I'm not sure dividing it based on, on ACT is actually useful, but it's useful for me. The two items that I want to flag, and there's a ton of funding opportunities under both of these, and I'm not trying to be exhaustive here. Um, I'm just trying to highlight a few. But on IRA, two things that are really high on our list that we're working on and that I think are going to be deeply impactful for the creation of my health and climate plan are the climate pollution reduction grants, which is a $5 billion program. Um, and included in that is an initial allocation of $250 million there has to be one applicant per, there will be at least one recipient per state, assuming that there are applicants in each state. Um, and that that 250 million is for planning. So that is, we are working hard to make sure that our comments and input in that process indicate that we've gone through a plan and we'd like to be able to leverage that plan for its fullest to make sure that we qualify as early and for as much fun as possible from that bigger five bill. So that is one thing that is really high on our list and it's going to be really crucial to figure out how we can really put um, some additional funding directly for the My Healthy Climate Plan, not just sort of this, this bucket aligns with our objectives. We can actually really structure it that way. Um, so that's a really big opportunity. The other one that I'll highlight in the IRA is the Greenhouse Gas Production Fund, $27 billion nationally, $7 billion to states competitively. There's a lot of questions about how it's going to actually be distributed. We're working through with partnerships and other states to provide comments and we'll be submitting modified responses. But that is, you know, informally referred to as the Green Bank Fund. Folks are familiar with that, that term and stuff, but it's $7 billion going to states, tribes, local governments to leverage private financing and drive for the adoption of uh, carbon reduced federal. So those are some of the big ones that are on our plate that we're thinking about. We'd love to continue to think about how to collaborate with folks on this call and, and more broadly. Um, and then I'm going to hit on uh, two of the more external facing pieces of our work that we've been doing. We're trying to make sure we target uh, certain stakeholder groups and make sure that we're engaging with them on a regular basis. Uh, in particular, we've started a quarterly process of meeting with all 12 tribal nations here in Michigan um, to align on 
our shared objectives around implementation of my healthy climate plan and to identify areas where we can collaborate. Um, and that we had our first meeting on that, which was really, really wonderful um, and meaningful for me. Um, we are meeting, continuing to meet and join. We provide updates quarterly to the Michigan Advisory Council on Environmental Justice, uh, which is facilitated through the Office of Environmental Justice Public Advocate here at Eagle. And we, so we provide updates there every quarter. We join every monthly meeting there as well and provide opportunities for additional input from that body on the work that we're doing here. Um, and we do intend uh, probably the next meeting, um, assuming the calendars work out for Regina and her team, will be pulling someone in from their team to provide an update to this council about the work that's going on with that as well. So we have a, a two way street on that communication. Um, the Catalyst Communities is the last one. So the work that we're doing to support local governments that is a robust program that we run at Eagle, and it is a big focus of where we're trying to pull in more resources from some of the federal dollars that are doing the state leadership program. So that's providing additional capacity training, resources, staffing, fellows, et cetera, to local governments across Michigan to help them uh, achieve their shared climate objectives uh, that we also have. So that's some, some of the kind of like uh, constituent based work. And then the last one, uh, the last update I'll share that I'm I'm very excited about. Uh, we sent out a save the date for April 11th and 12th for the My Health Climate Conference. It will be in Detroit in April 11th and 12th. Um, we are we have a number of things planned. We've got a lot. I've got a lot of dreams. Um, we'll see how many of them come true. Uh, but the general, the the high level framework for the for the two days will be um, we're we're planning to have some internal state of Michigan programming on the first half the first half of the first day. The second half of the first day will be largely um, high level topical speakers uh, sharing information about kind of urgency and hope at the moment and the opportunity to have federal funding, increased business interests, uh, policy landscape, et cetera, to really tackle climate action. And then the second day will be broken out into largely panel discussions uh, on very specific topics around how do we move forward on twenty communication? So the, the entire conference is going to move from the plan to action, inspiration, and action. This is kind of the intention. So the ask that I have for folks on the climate conference is: we are really interested in um, pulling together as many announcements as we can for that. Any new initiatives? Anything that we can do together uh, for folks that are on this call? Anything that we can work together to try and make sure is ready to go by then, um, or ideas that you have on what that could look like. Uh, we have a few things that we're cooking up, um, and we'll be able to share more about once we have, have a little bit more details. But uh, we're hoping to be able to to really make that a major event to to really kick off a lot of the work we're planning um, here in, in the second term of this administration and moving forward beyond that. So. Um, that's my one ask today for the group, other than asking you all to share a whole bunch of stuff. That you're you too. Um, that is everything that I have. I think I get my timing right on the dot if that clock's right. So um, the, the next part of the agenda here is I have, we have Doug Scott from Great Plains Institute, who you all are familiar with, to share a little bit more on some of the federal landscape. Um, you'll note that we, we didn't focus on state level landscape. I think we're still trying to figure out kind of where things shake out. And at the end of the day, we're we're focused on making sure that we continue to implement the plan that, that we all work together on. Um, and so that that's our that's our uh, where we're headed there. And we wanted to to have Doug share more about some of the federal federal pieces. And then after that I'll I'll jump back on the mic to introduce great thanks Corey. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Great to be with you again. Uh, this is going to be kind of a lightning round because I'm, I'm asked in a, in a really short period of time to talk about a lot of different things going on at the federal level. But uh, I'm from Illinois, so I talk fast. So hopefully uh, it'll be uh, it'll be understandable to you. So if um, my slides could come up, I can't I can't see them, but. Um, I think you're coming. OK. One more 
That's OK. So what I was asked to talk about today are things going on at the federal level. So I want to focus on the elections and what happened there. And, and again, all of this tying into what it means for the uh, My Healthy Climate Plan uh, and impl implementation of the of the plan. There we go. Thanks, Kimber. You can go to the next one. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the elections, uh, about uh, FERC uh, for a minute or two, a couple of things happening there. Then the Inflation Reduction Act uh, and other federal spending. Corey already talked about a lot of it, but I'll bring up a few more things uh, as it relates to, to the, the Healthy Climate Plan. And then just a little bit about the, the Conference of the Parties or COP27, because that, that uh, just wrapped up a couple of weeks ago. If we go to the next one. So a lot of this on the election, you've heard before and you've seen more in-depth analyses. And while uh, this was a very, very unusual midterm election cycle, um, that's a discussion uh, probably for another day in terms of, of why and what the, um, what the reasons were for it. Um, but a couple of the results end up meaning a lot for, for Michigan and for other states as they're pursuing their, their clean energy or their climate goals. So as, as of right now, as it stands, um, the Senate would end up with a right now with a 50 to 49 uh, Democratic advantage, as we know, a uh, week from today, there's the runoff in Georgia for the Senate seat there uh, between Senator Warnock and Mr. Walker. Um, and you might think that it really doesn't matter 50-50 where the vice president breaks the tie uh, in favor of the Dems or 51-49 in favor of the Dems if, if uh, Senator Warnock holds on. But it actually does make a difference in a couple of places. Right now in the Senate committees, because there's a 50-50, essentially a 50-50 tie, committees have equal representation of both parties. Uh, and that would change if if the Democrats were to hold a 51-49 majority, they would also then uh, be able to hold a majority, a one vote majority, but a majority in all the Senate committees as well. That may not seem like a lot, but they're the head person who's been appointed by the president to head up the air, the Office of Air and uh, Radiation at EPA, Joe Goffman, um, his his uh, nomination has been held up in part because um, of the 10-10 uh, tie and trying to get him reported out of out of committee. So it may make a difference in in certain in certain uh, instances. There, the other interesting thing about this election was that no incumbent senators lost. Um, I'm trying to remember, you know, a time where that where that happened uh, before, and it certainly has been a long time since that happened. The House, obviously, the Republicans took control of the House. They went from uh, 215 to 220 minority of a position to now what it looks right now. And again, there are certain races that are still uh, counting votes, but it looks like it'll be a 222 to 213 Republican advantage, a pickup of seven seats. That will mean a lot. That will make make significant changes um, in the House and mainly in the in the area of oversight. So you might have been seeing some of the reports already. So when Corey talks about the IRA, for example, uh, or we talk about the BIL and all of the money that's out there and DOE creating new programs, um, there is already a lot of rumbling that there will be a significant amount of oversight uh, that, that will be done at the congressional level. Um, you've heard people say that you know, that that there may be a hunt looking for the next Solyndra, for example, if you remember back uh, from some of the, the programs in the past, uh, looking for those those instances where um, where money might not have been used, the, uh, not the programs that ended up uh, being yeah. successful. So that's the kind of thing that, that we, I think we can expect to see. There was just an article in the trade press just this morning uh, about about this and and uh, expecting that uh, DOE and especially the IRA programs, the BIL programs, uh, and also the loan office, um, which after Solyndra essentially didn't make any loans for about seven years and is now ramping up significantly. Um, that may be under more intense scrutiny from from the House Republicans. So that's something to look look forward to. Uh, and in addition, legislatively, the legislative reality is that it's going to be very difficult to pass anything. If the if the Democrats control the Senate, the House uh, is controlled by the Republicans. 
you know, to the idea of getting another major piece of legislation on the on the environmental or energy side seems to be a little bit remote uh, at this point. If we go to the next slide, and I'll talk about this a little bit more. Uh, the Climate Committee in the House, the speculation is that that will go away uh, under the new leadership and that 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 committee will will no longer uh, be in existence. Um, the idea of permitting reform, which we've heard about uh, very much, it was it was uh, left out of the IRA. It was in an earlier version and then left out of the IRA. Uh, there's still some talk that something may happen, uh, maybe in the lame duck session before the new Congress takes over. Not really sure uh, about that. Uh, the influence of any one senator, if if the if the um, Democrats win the the remaining Senate seat in Georgia, obviously that's diminished uh, a little bit. Although the margin is still razor thin, so if two senators on the Democratic side decide they don't like something or want to change something, uh, they obviously have significant um, uh, significant power there, as as uh, Senator Manchin and Senator Sinema have had uh, in this Congress. There's a lot of talk about repealing the Inflation Reduction Act, the IRA, that Corey spent a lot of time talking about, and I'm going to talk about in a bit. Obviously, that's not going to happen. I mean, the Senate's not going to pass a repeal of the IRA. If they did, the president wouldn't sign it, and the likelihood of any kind of veto-proof majorities in either the House or Senate just isn't there. But you'll probably see the House uh, at least make an effort to try to repeal it. It won't go anywhere, but but again, that's something that'd be more symbolic. But again, that'll be part of the part of the discussion. And then FERC, uh, the chair, uh, Chairman Glick, uh, is has been reappointed, um, but he has not uh, his his um, um, his renomination has been held up uh, principally by Senator Manchin. Um, so this is the. Um, um, again, going back to talk about what the what the differences may be in in committee um, in committees if the majority grows a little bit, but but Chairman Glick obviously has whether you agree with them or not, but in terms of trying to implement the the My Healthy Climate Plan uh, and for other states that are trying to advance their clean energy goals, FERC has taken a much more much more aggressive, much more proactive stance toward trying to build out kind of the clean energy uh, infrastructure, transmission infrastructure. Um, and so um, that, you know, FERC seems obscure at times. Um, it's really not. It really does mean a lot. And so uh, Chairman Scripps, for example, is on the joint NARUC uh, FERC task force uh, that has been looking at at uh, transmission build out and a series of reliability and other issues uh, where they've been actually having some really strong discussions hard to say what will happen if if chairman glick is not uh if he's not confirmed for for another term uh at FERC. if he is not confirmed before the end of the year his appointment is done and he and he would have to leave his his spot and so the president would have to reappoint uh somebody else could reappoint him but would have to make a different appointment if we go to the next next slide I'm not going to talk much about this one at all. As Corey said, this is a discussion for another day uh, in terms of the states. The only thing I will point out is that Michigan has been um, having a lot of discussions with some of their regional regional partners. Uh, and I think with IRA, uh, with BIL, there are a lot of opportunities for regional cooperation. And I think the elections um, in, in states like uh, Wisconsin uh, and Illinois uh, and Minnesota uh, that that Michigan has been working a lot with. I think those the the election results only enhance that a little bit. If we go to the next slide, this is something from a from a uh, healthy climate plan that is going to have significant in, uh, influence in, over the next couple of years. Um, the Ooh. U.S. EPA is in March set to announce new regulations for the power sector. This would be both existing and new coal and gas plants. Um, you know, there's some speculation that the EPA put out a white paper. There's some speculation that they could require carbon capture, for example, on, on especially on new plants, but even on existing plants. Um, and then, you know, because the, the, um, the, Senate stayed in Democratic control. Efforts to try to nullify any rules from the congressional level 
wouldn't be successful. And for two years, they wouldn't be anyway because President Biden would just veto them uh, and there wouldn't be veto proof majorities for that. So whatever the EPA puts in place from a congressional standpoint would stand. But then you have to look at the courts and the recent West Virginia versus EPA decision uh, to see whether or not uh, EPA would have exceeded the authority that, that the courts um, limited them to in the West Virginia decision. But this has huge impacts because it will affect obviously all of the coal and gas plants throughout the country. Uh, Michigan has been part of groups that is looking at at modeling compliance options in the past uh, and will do that in the future uh, as well uh, to try to see you know how the the impact will be on on plants uh, in the state of Michigan. I'm gonna go really quickly through the last couple because so I, uh, I hit my time if you go to the next slide. So Corey already touched on a lot of this, but I'm I'm going to go through this. And obviously, I'm not going to read as I haven't been. I'm not going to read the the slides to you. But uh, he, the IRA, uh, the single, arguably the single largest climate and energy bill uh, since things like the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act. I mean, obviously, 360 odd billion dollars uh, going out into uh, different clean energy uh, programs, infrastructure. Um, Michigan, honestly, I'll, I'll brag on Michigan a little bit. They have been doing a tremendous job, uh, Corey and his team uh, and other agencies of identifying uh, where those opportunities are. Corey mentioned that earlier and he mentioned some of the opportunities that they're looking at as well. A uh, huge number of opportunities for states also for for thing and what Michigan has done that's that's really impressive uh, is is trying to see where opportunities if it's not the state that can apply for something but another entity within the state may be able to take advantage of that whether that's a local government uh, or a tribe or is it a, a private business that can take advantage of of different opportunities in these uh, in in these federal acts so they're really doing a great job with that that's the sprint team that's mentioned uh, in one of the bullets down there. Um, and then there's tremendous amount of coordination with other federal funding with IRA and the the um, the IJA, um, things like hydrogen, which Michigan has been playing a, a huge part in um, and a, 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 obviously a large amount of money at the federal level of that. Uh, Corey mentioned the Grid Resilience uh, Innovation Project or GRIP. Uh, that that Michigan is looking into um, a lot of opportunity there under the under uh, under the the federal legislation. If we go to the next slide, Kimber, this is only a small sample. Like Corey, if you wanted to be exhaustive about this, you have a two day webinar uh, in front of you to go through everything that's that's the federal funding opportunities. But there are so many things that will really help enhance. Um, you know, implementation of the the healthy climate plan um, clearly tying into the to the goals in a in all of the different sectors that the that the healthy climate plan is looking to reduce emissions in. Uh, but tax credits for a variety of clean energy sources, as we talked about, things like manufacturing tax credits, uh, the conversion grants to try to get at some of those kind of hard to decarbonize areas like some of the industrial areas that we've talked about during the development of the plan. Um, electrification, the not just heat pumps themselves, but also uh, dollars to incent the manufacturing of heat pumps uh, as well. Um, that's something that's a little bit <coughs> different. Uh, some some obviously some uh, some dollars there for things like biofuels, again, getting at some of those a little bit more difficult to decarbonize uh, areas. Uh, and then a ton of EPA programs, and Corey mentioned some of those. He he mentioned the pollution reduction grants, uh, the green banks, and the other uses that can be used from the, the GHG reduction fund, uh, but also for, for uh, heavy-duty vehicles, um, for, for air pollution near schools and in communities, trying to... to to really get at some of the things on a, from an EJ side that Michigan has been working at. Uh, and then it should be methane, not methane's uh, emission reductions, um, which again, uh, something that that um, if if Michigan's going to get to the goals that are um, that are set forth in the, the healthy uh, climate plan, um, methane reduction is going to be necessary there as it is uh, everywhere else. I would recommend to you the, the Michigan Economic Development Council has a terrific slide deck on the IRA. So I would heartily recommend that to you. Um, very, very 
uh, thorough, dense slides that talk about a lot of these different opportunities. I've, as I say, I've just scratched the surface here uh, as time would allow. And finally, I'll mention uh, the next slide, just a word or two about COP. Uh, not as much news coming out of this one as, as in previous uh, COPs. The, the biggest uh, development was the multi uh, multilateral development banks uh, designed for, for uh, wealthier countries that have contributed more to greenhouse gas emissions, subsidizing those countries that are feeling the effects, um, something that's been called for for a long time. Uh, no resolution on pathways to governments to achieve uh, 1.5 degrees. Celsius, although the 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 goal remains in effect, probably the biggest thing internationally wasn't actually from COP, but very significant the the United States and China uh, resuming their their climate talks as well. And then on the last slide, uh, just some conclusions. Uh, I've, I've gone through this already, but again, a lot to to do in a short period of time. But if you have any uh, questions, you know, afterwards or offline or want to get in touch with me and talk about any of this, I'm, I'm more than happy to do it. Uh, so thanks very much. I apologize, Corey. I went two minutes over and I will send it back to you to uh, introduce our next speaker. No worries, Doug. Thank you. That was wonderful. I, I actually have two quick things I wanted to follow up on just to highlight for folks that I think are, are interesting. And, uh, so one is uh, the DOE loans program um, that is something they are very aggressive about getting those resources out there. They've got the business development teams, and we got direct outreach from Jigger Shaw, the head of that program, just last night, trying to figure out how they can get more here in Michigan. And just with the context of potentially more scrutiny and oversight, there's a provision in the BIL that's really valuable to think about for folks that are thinking about going out for the loans program dollars. There is a one of the one of the funds, and I'll forget the exact number, so so I won't try to remember it. But uh, one of them is is historically been only for novel technologies, so new technologies that haven't been deployed more than three times. I think it's the general rule. If the state of Michigan puts money in and contributes, they will waive the novel fund requirement. So you can imagine if they're going to be on more scrutiny for folks looking for failure projects, they probably want to invest in commercially ready and viable technologies and that can help to unlock capital from somebody from the project. So finding that is one thing that is kind of hitting in there. And then the other one on the tax credits is just that, and Lisa mentioned this in the past, but it, governments and nonprofits can qualify for the tax credits now. And so there's actually a lot of figuring out how do we make sure that we can actually unlock that for those entities. And that does just because they can qualify doesn't mean that they have the upfront capital. So that would out the, the, the tax credit. So trying to figure out how we can, can uh, fill some of those gaps and get, get as many nonprofits and local governments to take advantage of this kind of standard is important. So with that, I will stop. We could do it all day. I'm sure I want to double up a couple of those things that, that are high on our mind. Um, next, we have Dr. Deanna Amen, uh, VP of Strategy, Policy and Sustainability of our next energy, uh, Michigan-based energy storage company. They're building you all recognize them from the headlines. Probably they're building a $1.6 billion battery manufacturing facility in Wayne County. Um, I'm very excited about this because I think it is kind of, when we think about where we're headed in the transition to a low carbon or carbon neutral economy, um, battery transportation uh, and uh, grid storage are um, crucial and our two global markets in Michigan has the opportunity to be at the center of uh, and have some real resilience for our industries and our manufacturing base in the way that I think is, is unique. Uh, and I think that this, the project and, and the work that, that the team at, at one is doing is, is really um, at the forefront of a lot of that. Uh, and it really does speak to some of the major priorities that we have in the client plan around workforce, around battery storage uh, and the battery storage target around PV deployment um, and, and related uh, uh, supply chains and, and um, research and investment and uh, and also thinking about how are we leveraging these federal funds to make sure that we can bring as many of these, these companies to Michigan and then help help deploy the technologies that they're bringing there. So um, anyway, with that, I'll go ahead and hand it over. Uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to this. And, Thanks. <clears throat> Thank you, Corey. I appreciate 
I am just going to share a screen really quickly. Just give me one second. Hi everyone, it's a pleasure to, to be with you all today. Uh, I'm Deanna Ahmed. I uh, lead uh, strategy, policy, and sustainability at One. Um, we're an energy storage company, as um, Corey said, headquartered uh, here in Novi, Michigan. Uh, we were founded in July of 2020 by Majib Ijaz, and over the past two and a half years have scaled um, to, to grow our footprint um, here in Michigan. We're almost 200 full-time employees um, and have raised um, over $200 million to date um, and are working to bring energy storage products to both the mobility and stationary uh, marketplaces, you know, very much focused on uh, the opportunities at hand right now in order to, to decarbonize uh, our economy. Um, we've got some phenomenal investors um, that have helped us to, to grow um, to where we are today, uh, most notably um, Breakthrough Energy Ventures, um, Bill Gates Climate Impact Fund, um, led our Series A and has really helped us to um, position ourselves in the in the decarbonization efforts that are um, you know, growing and, and to think about Michigan's place in all of that. Um, so one is focused on um, three core values um, and uh, that have driven the mission and the development of all of our products to date. Um, so our um, principal mission that, that Majib was focused on initially is around the doubling of range of electric vehicles in order to increase market adoption. Um, the doubling of range really was a... Uh, a you know, a, a prospective solution that we were seeking to achieve in order to be able to electrify the, the types of vehicles and platforms that consumers are um, used to driving, particularly larger vehicles. Um, and when we looked at the current um, EV marketplace, as well as the options that are out there for our larger vehicles, we have, you know, noticed, and as the, as the market has started to move to larger vehicles, that the, the range does not really satisfy consumers' needs, and that's where range anxiety can be a huge deterrent to market adoption. Um, so in doubling the range of, of our battery products, we're working to really mitigate that the challenge and and drive towards a uh, a place where a consumer can select an electric vehicle as their only vehicle. In in working to double the range of an EV, we've been principally focused also on safety and consumer safety uh, in particular, um, because when we've seen a lot of battery technologies try to increase in their energy density offerings on board, we have sometimes seen safety suffer. Um, and so one of the other things that we focused on is the avoidance and, and mitigation of nickel and cobalt within our battery products. And these two raw materials, um, avoiding them is um, valuable from a safety perspective because we're mitigating um, a, a risk of thermal runaway that is seen with nickel cobalt based chemistries. But we also think about the safety of um, the supply chain that we're um, utilizing and, and the you know human rights violations that um, happen with um, uh, upstream supply chains, particularly with cobalt, which is mined in uh, the dependent uh, DRC. And so uh, in our um, effort to avoid these two materials, uh, we're we're still working to to double range without compromising um, consumer safety. Uh, and finally, we've been focused on the development of a North American cell and material supply chain. Um, you know, that work that we've um, been doing since the the birth of the company has definitely accelerated as um, the uh, both the infrastructure bill as well as IRA. Um, came to bear, and and we see a lot of movement in the market, which is phenomenal um, for the time and place that we we are currently in. Um, so just to put a little bit of a finer point on why these obstacles to mass EV adoption are are so important to focus on, um, starting with range on the left here. Uh, when we look at EPA rated range uh, and then we look at the real world condi driving conditions that um, people typically have to um, deal with when they're when they're driving their electric vehicle, uh, we, we can see an up to 50 percent reduction in range um, from leveraging heat or um, driving with a, a higher speed. And so that you know reduction in range is really the thing that we're working to solve for is the real world range needs to be palatable 
vehicle, um, even when we're electrifying these larger trucks and SUVs, um, so that we can actually fully start to decarbonize our transportation sector. Um, with safety, to, to go a little bit more into why we are focused on avoiding nickel and cobalt uh, is because of the evolution of oxygen that happens when there's a, a short circuit for uh, a nickel cobalt chemistry cell. That doesn't happen when you have an iron-based chemistry like lithium iron phosphate. And so for the nickel cobalt chemistries, we've seen five um, NHTSA recalls um, over the last um, little bit of time here. And um, so our focus on um, Iron-based chemistries has been um, uh, supportive of, you know, the avoidance of that risk of safety. Um, but then finally, on supply chain, uh, we we do see additional benefits in in mitigating the nickel and cobalt that we're um, in, in minimizing use of that in our products because of price escalation. So lithium is a, a material that we hear a lot about, and and the volatility and the price escalation as demand um, for for batteries has increased. Um, but nickel and cobalt have also um, followed similar price escalations. Um, and so we are um, prioritizing more sustainable, more abundant materials like iron and manganese um, for our chemistries that that we're using in our in our technologies. And that has both a, a cost upside, um, a sustainability upside, and then finally um, a localization up, upside because the of the abundance of these materials and the ability to source iron domestically and even leverage recycled feedstocks um, for iron. So um, with this framework, we, we you know set to bring products to market that could service those uh, those two uh, markets. And I'll, I'll speak about two of our products now in a, a little bit more um, detail. So um, in in founding one, we we um, sought to come to market early in in being able to service the commercial market, um, so the commercial truck uh, and bus market. And so our first product to market is um, Aries, um, Aries One to be specific. Uh, and this product is a all lithium iron phosphate battery pack um, that has um, some novel kind of systems architecture innovations that is making it, uh, that is allowing us to be a market leading product um, we are going to be starting manufacturing for this product in um, Q1 of 2023 um, and have built a, you know, over $4 billion book of business for this product over the next several years. Um, what we are doing here that's unique is that we're taking a um, an iron-based chemistry LFP and we're packaging it such that um, our systems level energy density is competitive uh, in the market against the nickel and cobalt chemistry pack products that we see from Tesla or, or Volkswagen. And, and that's really because we have this high CELTA pack um, volumetric efficiency that is, is allowing us to, to really lift the energy of the entire system up. Um, because LFP as a chemistry has typically been, well, it's safer um, and, and cheaper to manufacture. It's been um, not looked at as a market leading opportunity because of the lower energy density of at the cell level. But with Aries One, we really combined safety and range and achieved that doubling of range for that for this pack against um, you know comparable packs in the market. Um, and so we're we're looking forward to bringing this product to market, as I said, in early 23. Um, what's uh, you know one of the components of this product is that we're leveraging an imported cell. So this unit of, of energy storage um, we're, we're importing from Asia. And um, as the company matured and um, the inflation, uh, you know, actually predating the Inflation Reduction Act, the infrastructure bill was passed, we then saw the, the ecosystem and the opportunity that would be able to motivate our ability to manufacture both cells and packs uh, domestically. And so I'll speak a little bit more about that um, in a moment. Um, when looking at the ability to double the the range of an EV, this is something that um, is is truly novel with respect to one. Uh, is that we've developed a product called Gemini um, that really does answer that call in a consumer EV platform. Um, and what Gemini is is it's a a new type of battery 
architecture. And so it's really a reinvention of what a battery can be uh, in that we are using two battery chemistries in one. Um, and so this architecture, which allows for kind of range extension, um, can enable uh, 600 miles of range um, by pairing these two chemistries, one that's leveraged for daily driving, and then the second that is um, used for occasional road trips. And when you look at the um, decision uh, behavior uh, of, of a consumer, um, they're purchasing a vehicle for the the um, you know the road trip range or the 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 longer range that they may need um, on occasion. And so what we've done in this architecture is we've paired, LFP or the iron based chemistry for that daily driving, um, which provides about 150 miles of range um, for the for a ve for the vehicle. And then we're pairing that with a, a, a new chemistry that we've developed um, over the past two and a half years, um, which is able to offer that extended range of 450 miles. And the way in which that's working is that this uh, that the iron based chemistry has a much higher cycle life uh, while it is, you know, lower in energy density. Um, but so it can accomplish that the, the length and the durability that you need for daily driving. Well, the anode free cell, um, which, is, which is a type of cell that we've developed over the past two and a half years, it's a very high energy cell, um, but has a much lower cycle life. And so we're marrying the two together to be able to then accommodate that increased um, range. And so this is a product that um, we're excited to, to bring to market as well that we're currently in development for. Most notably, um, we're in a development program with BMW um, and we'll be de demonstrating uh, 600 miles in the IX platform using this technology um, in early 2023. And um, we you know, are talking to many uh, OEMs currently about this technology because it is, it's a novel architecture that is bringing a, a lot of systems engineering and power electronics to bear to create um, a, a range extender um, that can be applied in, in many other um, scenarios, but we will first apply it to the OEM market. The only other thing that I'll say about Gemini that that's novel is that from a um, resource efficiency perspective, you know, the, the argument sometimes against doubling the range of an EV is that if you double the range, maybe you're wasting that battery for a lot of the time if it's just sitting there. Um, and what's unique about this architecture is that the anode free cell is actually um, uh, using the, it's deleting one of the components of our cells. So there's no graphite in the cell. So actually from a minerals or kilograms per kilowatt hour perspective, it's a more resource efficient battery product because of the pairing of these two chemistries. Um, so it kind of does also um, answer the sustainability question of this is the right way to approach range extension so that you're not um, oversizing a system that could la you know, have the right number of cycles for um, the entire system, but we're really pairing the two needs together. Um, finally, you know, the other um, big, big idea that we're bringing to fruition is um, a low cost uh, supply for manufacturing cells in the United States. And we're, we're very excited to, in October, announce One Circle, um, which will be our first gigafactory, um, which will have 20 gigawatt hours of capacity um, had right in Van Buren Township in Michigan. Um, we were really excited to be supported by the state of Michigan with um, $200 million of grant funding, um, amongst other um, supports. And what we're what we're doing in um, one circle is we are um, working to uh, increase our um, renewable energy penetration by um, doing something that we call gigafactory to grid. Um, and we'll we'll do this in a in a couple different modalities. But the the intent is that as we manufacture cells, um, we can both assure quality of our energy storage products and provide a service to the grid um, by by doing a, a cell burn-in for um, 30 days or a fixed 
amount of time. And that's something that we've been um, uh, building. A, it's, a, it's a brand new model. and We've been working in partnership with DTE Energy um, around bringing that model um, to fruition in this in this facility. Um, you know, we call it one circle as well, because um, like many other in this industry, we are prioritizing the circularity of our um, uh, ecosystem. And so we have uh, selected a, a recycling partner who then can feed stock in um, our recycled scrap or end of life products into our into material processing to be then used again um, in our manufacturing um, process. And so at this facility, we will produce um, all uh, LFP cells. So uh, Aries 1 will have a, a follow on uh, pack product called Aries 2 um, that will um, leverage cells from this factory. We will also produce the, um, the cells for Gemini um, and uh, the, the goal and intent is to be able to service OEMs uh, with respect to the Gemini and Aries 2 pack products. We also are building a um, utility scale energy storage system that we call Aries Grid. It's an all LFP, um, 40 foot container, six megawatt hour um, uh, system. And that's something that we're also very excited about um, working to bring to market. We'll do our first pilot of that in, in early 23 um, and then hope to even support the, the increase of storage um, here in the state of Michigan um, by seeing some deployment opportunities here. Um, I will, you know, pause there and I'm happy to an uh, answer any questions that anybody has um, about the company uh, and, our, and our growth plans. But, you know, I think the last thing that I'll say is that we're, we're very excited and focused on the growth of the human capital that's going to be supportive of this factory. So we're going to bring over 2,000 jobs um, to this facility at scale of uh, 20 gigawatt hours of capacity. Um, and we're um, have been actively, you know, working with both the state as well as um, the federal government around workforce development strategies and thinking about um, the training and then uh, upward mobility opportunities of, of clean tech manufacturing um, as the, the boom is really in full swing. Um, and, and we're excited to be, you know, a part of the fabric of, of transitioning um, to clean tech manufacturing here in the state. So yeah, happy to, to answer any questions. Um, uh, Corey, if there's anything I left out, please let me know. No, nothing Nothing that I was looking for. I was, like, I was about to ask you about the, the work, so, um, but that was great. I really appreciate it. Uh, did anyone have questions or comments? Hi, Carrie. Oh, hey, Deanna. Great presentation. <laughs> Could you tell us about, um, you said you're going for 600 mile range, but didn't you already beat that? Yeah, so we did uh, at the end of last year, we did a 752 mile um, range run from uh, Hanovi to the UP, um, swung by Lansing and then um, came back to our uh, headquarters in Novi. Um, that was in a Tesla that we um, put our um, Gemini battery pack into. Um, and so, yeah, we did a, a range run last year. Um, but the the one that we'll do with um, BMW will be a you know a production intent um, a pack product that we're, we would like to to bring to market. The the Tesla one was not with um you know the it was kind of a, a demonstration project that we did um to demonstrate what's possible and so it, it was um the longest drive ever done on an ev um we have not formally submitted it for any records but um to our knowledge longest longest single charge um drive in an ev thank you C congratulations If no one else has a question, I have one, which is my question of the day, which is, uh, are there any federal funding opportunities on the horizon that you all are looking at with in our looks at the partnership or the opportunity of working with the Michigan? Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's there's definitely um, a few opportunities we're paying um, close attention to. Actually, my ears perked up when you talked about LPO. 
um, and the work that you're doing. Um, so on the DOE side, um, we are currently looking at two grant opportunities that were just released around um, stationary storage. We also are um, looking at reapplying for the cell manufacturing grants as those are re-released. Um, and then we are um, going to um, be uh, applying for the loan program office as well in early 2023. So it would be really interested to know um, what the work that the state is doing um, and the work, you know, we're paying a lot of attention to other opportunities. I know that there are some that are state focused and one would be very interested in being kind of participatory with any um, collaborative funding that's sought from DOE. Um, and then on the Inflation Reduction Act, we are um, very uh, lucky to be able to benefit from the production tax credits. So there is um, $35 a kilowatt hour that is given for cell manufacturing, $10 a kilowatt hour for module um, or pack manufacturing, and then 10% uh, credit for electrode manufacturing. And we'll be able to um, take benefit of, of the breadth of that and, you know, for benchmark, it's about 130 to 150 dollars a kilowatt hour um, costs for uh, cost uh, for cells currently that are manufactured in, in the US. So it is a pretty significant tax credit. And, and then finally, we are benefiting from the investment tax credits on standalone storage and then consumer vehicle tax credits as those support our customers who then um, are interested in domestic sourcing. And so that domestic sourcing ecosystem is also something that we're really excited about because of the prioritization of um, supply for companies like ours. Okay, well, I can keep going. I've got one more uh, that, I, that I think maybe would be good for the benefit of folks. Because you and I have talked about this at some point, but why um, why you all chose Michigan specifically? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So Michigan, so the, the company was actually founded formally in Silicon Valley um, and was brought back to Michigan within the first couple of months of um, being founded in California. Um, and that was very much ha had everything to do with the talent that is here in Michigan and um, a team that was able to come together really quickly to to work um, a team that had worked with Majib as our CEO and founder previously. Um, so that that was a huge um, starting point for the location of our corporate and engineering headquarters. Um, our, you know, source uh, the decision to to bring the factory to the state was also very much uh, with respect uh, decided with respect to the proximity of material supply chain in in Canada. Um, so we've been building some raw material supply chain partnerships there. Um, our, I would say the, the workforce development opportunities as well, the translational opportunities from combustion engine workforce to, to clean tech manufacturing like battery manufacturing. And then finally, I'd say just the commitment of the state to, um, to bring projects like this um, here and the utility partners as well. Um, so yeah, we're really excited to, to grow in Michigan and we think that Michigan can be a, uh, you know, a, a uh, headquarter opportunity for um, battery manufacturing and the more and more of the supply chain that we bring here the better the the costs uh, will be for for companies like ours and and then the ability to expand and continue to localize jobs um, will will also grow great I think thank you Beth, do you have a question the, I'm sorry, excuse me, but the, the meeting is for the council members to, to speak only. Um, so if you want to put a question in the chat, we can try to answer after the meeting. Did you all hear that? Um, yeah, okay, well, anyway, we did, thank you. And if that, you do want to put that in the chat, we we'll appreciate it. Um, we will. Uh, I can't see the chat, so I don't know if it's in there and, and we can ask it. But um, we can, we can, I can hand it to Doug Scott here to take us to the next portion, and then um, we can try to work in, in the question as we go. Well. So, 
Sure, thanks, Corey. Um, so the the next forty five minutes um, were planned for for us to um, take the pulse of the of the council members and for you to talk about. Um, you know, we've heard from Corey and we've heard from uh, you know what's happening at the federal level and had the great presentation from Nina. Um, so the 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 question here is. Is now from a council member standpoint, what are some of the things that you've been working on, and how do those relate uh, to the to the healthy climate plan? So, um, you know, there's a few of you that I know that aren't shy that will probably step up and 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 want to uh, contribute right away. But I will want to go around the horn and and try to get at least you know a couple three minutes maybe from from folks as to some of the things that they've been working on. And how your efforts uh, fit into the uh, into the healthy climate plan. So that's that's kind of the the goal for the next uh, for the next several minutes here. Um, and um, and Corey, you, did you want me to to feed some of the questions from the chat to Dina or or not? I I actually think it's, it's yeah. If you're able to answer those, yeah, I can do that. Sure. So Dina, are you good for a couple questions here? I think are, we got are, three. Are you able to answer them in the? Sorry, Doug, I was unclear. Are you able to answer them in the chat, Deanna, yeah, directly? I can do that. And then we can kind of. Oh, okay, that would be great. I think there are three of them there, um, um, Deanna. So. Okay. Thanks. So for the council members, and again, um, as was stated just a minute ago, um, appreciate everybody being here. The discussion. Portions are just for the the council members uh, themselves. So so thank you. So Deanna, I appreciate you answering those questions in the chat. So for council members, uh, teen it up. Um, you know some of the the things that you've been working on. Um, and um, see if anybody raises their hand. And if not, I may just call on on some folks. So we'll see how this works out. All right, I see Carrie. You're you're on my screen. You're right below me. So you also know um, that I'm gonna I'm gonna call on you first. <laughs> um, well, I guess I have two updates. Thanks, and this was wonderful. Um, I'm sorry I wasn't there with you guys in person today. Um, I'm gonna give Peck's update if that's okay, because he actually wrote it down for me, and he's not sure. able to join today's call. So Sam, back me up if I screw any of this up as the other Wolverine on the call go blue. Um, Peck says he's working to coordinate institutions of higher ed across Michigan to work together to help ensure a durable long-term effort to reach the goals of the Michigan Healthy Climate Plan. That's one. Two, he's working to create major new cross-campus University of Michigan initiative focused on accelerating a just energy transition in Michigan and beyond. Three, working with colleagues across University of Michigan campus and in Detroit to create a new University of Michigan Center of Innovation in Detroit with a focus on supporting business and community partnerships focused on sustainability and a just transition in Detroit, Michigan and beyond. So these are efforts that began in 2022. He hopes they become more real in 2023. And he says, you can ask me if you have any questions. Um, so that's Peck's update. Sam, how'd I do? Okay, and then I'll, I wrote down my own update so I wouldn't forget stuff. Um, so um, earlier today, uh, and some of you may jo have joined this, but earlier today I led a conversation about the forthcoming US Department of Energy Foundation. It passed in the CHIPS Plus Act, which then got gobbled up by the Inflation Reduction Act. So most of you probably missed it, but there was an act of Congress that stood up the first ever Department of Energy Foundation, which affords a whole new set of opportunities to leverage DOE funding, perhaps do better uh, commercialization, community engagement and the like. So if anyone wants to know more about that, that's some of the national work I'm doing. But as you guys know where I live, um, Let's see other stuff. Uh, Sam knows plenty about this as the founding director of the C Sustainability Clinic in Detroit. We've been adding new clients um, to that work, tackling issues such as flooding and air quality, civic capacity, the elderly, safety, heat and mobility. Um, so really exciting stuff. So kind of just building off of what Peck's already said. Um, one thing I'm interested in, Doug, is really using 2023 to push um, on the public facing storytelling side of Michigan's competitive, relative competitive climate advantage. Um, I think about things like Deanna's company and site selection that could have gone anywhere in the world. And she just gave you some insight as to why they chose Michigan. 
I don't think they'll be, they were the first, I don't think they'll be the last, and it's something I want to lean heavily into. I think to quote Liesl, it's a bit about filling that white space and just um, frankly telling the story, being a little less Midwestern, dialing up the gumption. Um, other stuff we're working on, in addition, if you didn't figure it out already, disclosure, I'm an advisor at one, um, but I'm working with other companies like theirs that are both in Michigan and the Midwest um, for the same purposes to really lift up the center of the country as a climate tech uh, center of strength um, and expanding this practice that I lead into including bringing more talent to the Midwest, retaining the talent we have, and boomeranging the folks like myself who left and can come back uh, for great opportunities. Um, I'll pause there because that was plenty. How's that for your extra moment for the day? That was great. Thank you, Carrie. Anybody else? Sam, your name got used twice in debate there, so I'm going to go to you next. That's fair. That's fair, Doug. Um, hi, folks. Uh, as a reminder, my day job is as a professor at U of M School for Environment and Sustainability, SEAS. My work year was shorter than usual because I became a father for the first time. Um, but in the time that I had to work, I continued academic research on several aspects of the climate change mitigation challenge. Um, those aspects include transportation, um, household energy conservation, uh, institutional carbon neutrality goals and different ways to achieve them, uh, and also some work on the, the sort of practice of environmental and climate economics, that's what I am, um, uh, and how it can start better addressing systemic racism. That's all. I'm not going to go any further into that. That's academic research that I think you know is related to what is named and defined in the in the Healthy Climate Plan. Um, maybe a little more practically relevant in this context is my advisory work. Um, I advise a PhD student at SEAS. His name is Carl Hoesch. Um, his dis dissertation is focused on energy justice, with particular emphasis on procedural justice and clean energy expansion. So. He's evaluating um, data from an experience with the state of Michigan's pilot program, Clean Energy Low Income Communities Accelerator, that's Celica. Um, and he's also on a, on a, a multi institution team developing a survey, a nationwide survey on attitudes about large scale solar installations that's led by Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Um, so I'm helping out with some work there that I think speaks especially to siting challenges um, and attitudes about clean energy. Uh, and as Carrie touched on briefly um, when she mentioned the clinic um, or to fill in, um, uh, in addition to that, I, I advise a team of CS students in their capstone project um, under the auspices of the sustainability clinic that Carrie runs on. And this project is on mitigation and adaptation to flooding on the east side of Detroit. They're working with a, um, they're developing strategy recommendations for a neighborhood organization in Detroit, Jefferson East uh, Inc. Um, so adaptation, water, not you know delved into in the healthy climate plan, but I think very much a cousin or related to uh, you know um, what we're trying to do here. As for next year, I'll just say I'm returning to teaching in earnest undergrad and graduate courses on climate econ, policy and justice. And I do plan to use the climate action plan in the classroom, you know, to assign it as a reading, prompt discussion among students and and ideally create an assignment based on that plan on the plan that we've helped develop here. I'll stop there. Excellent. Sounds like a good course. I like it. All right, Who who's next? Anybody want to volunteer? I can jump Ron, in go, before you thank call you, my sir. name. Go right ahead. <laughs> I figure I'll, I've been somewhere in the Hollywood squares. Um, yeah, so several different updates there. We're, we are an active supporter of sign on to the innovation centers via Purdue and U of M. Uh, we're actually starting to sponsor some of the C's master students. We'll be sending several that way. We're actually splitting our program between Purdue and U of M over the next year for our leader engineering leadership development program. So don't spoil the, the surprise there, Sam, but uh, some more will be coming your way as we start to ramp up both data analytics and uh, sustainability as, as core capabilities going forward. Um, and then hopefully getting started with PEC on on developing concepts like our Renew House uh, there within within Michigan. 
Uh, renewable energy continue to expand that, um, including DC, our um, behind the meter uh, microgrids will continue to ramp up and continue to explore those opportunities here, both at our offices in Michigan as well as uh, around the Midwest with some pretty big success and some some new announcements coming very soon, um, as well as uh, uh, meeting our 10 year global target on getting zero waste to landfill at all of our 31 manufacturing sites. Uh, unfortunately, not in Michigan, but obviously we'll be then expanding it to our warehouses and, and offices as we've now reached that across all 31. Uh, so some good, good, uh, I would say expansion there. Um, and then we've worked on and submitted several areas in the energy management space um, with uh, three new national lab grants acceptances here uh, lately to advance some of the, the work that we're doing in, in the space around looking at the time of use of demand side uh, when we look at how we're going to make that just transition uh, in the proper way and, and doing uh, additional retrofits now expanding it to the energy water nexus as well as the energy space uh, to to help uh, do that through some nonprofits uh, in retrofits for disadvantaged communities. Uh, Firstly, working in the southwest and, and, and west, but looking for opportunities here, both in Detroit and Grand Rapids going forward. So lots of, uh, I would say, uh, activity in the, in the space, but uh, uh, a clear need for more connection on some of the IRA and some of the different work I know was discussed here today that we want to continue to expand and, and grow in. Great. Thanks, Ron. Thanks for volunteering, too. I can go next. Uh, Cynthia? Gary, Gary, I'll go. go ahead. Yeah, um, here at MDARD, we're just really excited to um, announce that we have two of our top people here, Kathy Anger, Deputy Director, John Mallett, our Chief um, Policy Advisor, have really stepped up and are leading the team internally here at MDARD through our divisions. And I see they're both in the back of the room, so I'll turn it over to them to let you know what they're up to. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Director. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, so folks can see you and make sure they can hear you. Well, it's good to see all of you today, and I want to do a wave to dance scripts first. <laughs> uh, thank you, Director. And yes, he's right. Um, John and I have been tasked with coming up with a plan for MDARD moving forward. And you know that John is our policy advisor. I'm the deputy director. And so John has been reaching out to a lot of you and asking what's going on in your division so that we can formulate and sort of piggyback on what you're doing. Because we know that MDARD is going to make a large contribution to the Michigan Healthy Climate. We're working in agriculture and soil and water forest so there's a lot of area for us to make a contribution and um, I think the big part is is determining first where do we stand today what is MDAR doing today that could be captured and quantified and, and contribute to to the results and sent on to people to say here's what we're doing so at to that end at this point what we are doing is making sure that our staff primarily our executive team, our supervisors, our program division directors, et cetera. You know what the Michigan Healthy Climate Plan is? The plan came out. Um, one of the things that we found is that when we asked people, what do you think about the Michigan Healthy Climate Plan? Hmm. Let me learn more about that. So that's where we're starting that foundation of making sure that people know what the plan is, how they can contribute, and what it means to them and to the residents of our state. With that, I'm going to turn it over to John to give a little more about what we're doing, um, but that educational foundation was missing. And, and so, you know, I know it's been the plan's been out for some months, but at the same time, we don't want it to be dusty sitting on the shelf and nothing in MDAR is contributing to it because we have a lot of good things going on that we believe will, will contribute to what the numbers vision is. Um, yeah, so I think Kathy just said said it really great, of course. Um, but I think our plan moving forward can be pretty easily divided into three steps. First step, as Kathy said, is education, and that's mostly aimed at MDART itself, um, making sure our staff know what the Healthy Climate Plan is, and basically saying, well, we already do a lot of these things, so how do we kind of make it match up? 
Um, the second one is to survey MDARD and see exactly what are they doing. Figuring out, you know, like I said, we know we do a lot for the climate already, but in the executive office, we might not know the exact details of a lot of our programs and things that our staff on the ground are steeped in day to day. And then the, the third step would be to kind of quantify, capture, and then report out what we're doing. Kind of similar to what Kathy said, how do we how do we tell the world all the good things MDARD is doing? How do we report to Eagle all of the, the good uh, uh, climate programs that we're doing and things like that? So um, more to come on that. We'll see. And we're excited to contribute and happy to engage with all of you guys here. And the last thing, after we capture what we're already doing, um, you know, asking the staff what innovative practices uh, should we be looking at going forward? And we've met as an executive team already to, to map out steps. And we're at the beginning stages of that. What happens in 2023, 2024, and beyond? And so with that, the, the survey of the staff is going to inform what's next. So we don't want to just rest on our laurels and say, okay, here's what we've done, and that's the end of it. Oh, no, there's much more to do, and MDR is fully engaged in that. Yeah, and I'll just add that, that we've had a chance to, to connect, and I think I mentioned earlier some of the climate liaison work we've been doing at Eagle, and I'm really excited to hear and see MDAR stepping up and kind of running with this, and we can share some of our best practices, but they're already coming up with new and creative ways to mobilize uh, their own department, um, and I think we're, we're just going to see more and more opportunities for collaboration as we work with other departments and some similar efforts. So uh, really grateful for that. And I, I know we've gotten to chat a couple of times and, and looking forward to it. Really cool. Just wanted to, to chime in there that that's it's something that's really, really well for me. Director McDowell is fully on board with this, um, pushing us, you know, to higher to higher places. So so with that direction, um, you know, I know that there'll be next time we meet in this room, we'll have a lot more. Great. Thanks, Kathy, John, director. Thank you. Um, I've got three more volunteers lined up. I uh, love this group. Uh, Cynthia Williams first, then uh, Brandon Hoffmeister. Oh, thanks, Doug. Just um, Ford continues to accelerate our goals toward our carbon neutrality uh, plan, which is no later than 2050. And we're really talk, focusing on actions just beyond the, the, the great vehicles we have, like the Mustang Mach-E and F-150 Lightning. In August, I think we um, announced with uh, DTE, the largest renewable energy purchase uh, from a utility in, in U.S. history. And so that's one of the things. And in, in just uh, this November, we also announced a partnership with Manufacture 2030. It's to help uh, our Ford suppliers meet their carbon reduction targets as well. Uh, again, focusing everyone on that no later than 2050 goal. We're also, um, as part of COP27, uh, we were a founding member of First Movers Coalition in terms of in the aluminum sector and is making um, progress towards um, purchasing at least 10% of our primary aluminum and steel purchases from net zero uh, carbon emissions by 2030 as well. We've uh, restructured the company uh, to focus on our electrification uh, business, and that's evident with the Ford Model E uh, business that we stood up uh, along with our Ford Pro. Uh, group that's uh, geared at uh, our commercial vehicle sector. So we're really, um, you know, putting our money where our mouth is. We have over $50 billion invested uh, in our carbon uh, neutrality strategy uh, and electrification strategy. So we're really proud of what we're doing. Thanks. Thanks, Cynthia. Uh, Brandon, and then Phil. Yeah, thanks, Doug. Uh, so here at Consumers, I, I would bucket a lot of our actions in this space as, you know, one, we're reducing our own emissions consistent with the governor's plan and vision. Uh, two, we're enabling others to reduce their emissions uh, from their energy usage. Um, and then three, we're adapting our system to extreme weather risks uh, to make sure that it's resilient going forward. So in the bucket of reducing our own emissions, uh, we've talked about in the past, you know, we had an industry leading clean energy plan in our electric business. Uh, settled and approved uh, earlier this year. So we'll be coal free by 2025, one of the first utilities in the country that gets us about a 60% carbon reduction from 2005 levels. 
uh, which is exceeds the 1.5 degree scenario. So we've got a utility that's really on the forefront of carbon reduction. Um, and now uh, we're in execution mode. So um, we've got to make this plan real. So we're issuing RFPs. We competitively bid all the supply, um, all the renewable energy that we need and the energy storage that we need. So we're working with developers and communities to site uh, this new renewable energy build out that's going to enable us um, to, to move towards significant uh, emissions reductions. Um, on the gas side of the business, we're also making significant progress. Doug, you mentioned methane emissions. Methane is 100 times more powerful than CO2 in the short run. And so we have a real goal to reduce methane emissions from our gas system. We're on track to reduce over 400 metric tons this calendar year, which is going to be ongoing, and uh, to have net zero methane emissions. Oh, Brandon froze. All right. In the enabling Look, others, um, Brandon, you, know, you uh, froze for a minute, so you you got to you got to net zero emissions by, and then you froze for about thirty seconds. Uh, on methane. Yeah. On methane. Brandon, can you hear us? All right, let me, let me <laughs> come back to him, Phil. Okay, Phil, sorry. Let me let me. Oh wait. Let, let me come back to you back in a couple on? minutes, Brandon. Uh, I'll, I'll go off video. Maybe that will help my band. Great. Phil, go ahead. Then we'll come, okay. we'll come back. We'll circle back. Okay, good. Thanks, Doug. Uh, two things. Uh, first, I want to, uh, I couldn't always hear Corey earlier, but I, he made some reference to local decarbonization action. And I, I just want to, First thing I want to do is just uh, lift up some action in Washington County that's that's going on because there's an interesting sort of model emerging. Uh, this is something I'm just tangentially involved in because uh, I'm the incoming chair of a group called the Wolf Pack that uh, has spearheaded uh, this work to organize a climate collaborative that's cross county, cross governmental units, uh, businesses included, the hospital systems uh, are getting involved, um, educational systems. And it's it's the, the what has happened over the last year or two is just sort of an incubation and a couple of summits where all these groups have gotten together with the idea of setting targets, uh, making uh, individual commitments to carbon reduction, um, working together to actually achieve those efforts. And uh, there's been a sort of a groundswell where a number of these groups are really involved in it. And I, I won't say more about it here, but I just say there's a model there that I think could be scalable because uh, it's really, I think uh, you probably know this way better than I do, Doug, but uh, the challenge of working in overlapping governmental units where nobody's really in charge and then, you know, engaging businesses at the same time. Uh, um, I, I think there's been some great work by the Wolfpack team and some of the community leaders in that. And I just would love to see that uh, scaled in some way and it may need some help from the state it may need some funding um, uh, but i think there's something there that uh, is going to be essential the other thing this is a little bit off script it's not really something i'm doing but it's something i think maybe we as the council should be thinking ahead to um, we didn't talk much you talked a little bit about the results of the election uh, we have a different in the state we have a different composition of the senate and the house and i, I don't want to get ahead of whatever the governor's uh, uh, new second term agenda is and as well the uh, the leaders in the House and the Senate. But it does seem like we ought to really be thinking as a council about staying apprised of and weighing in on um, what I would think would be some important legislative policy opportunities as well as appropriation actions to really put in place a lot of the stuff that we, we've got as a, as a goal or as initial thinking in the plan. Uh, really, we have maybe a, a once in a lifetime opportunity to, to make some of that enduring and real. And I just hope, uh, I hope we'll engage in that as uh, the governor's agenda and the legislative agenda evolves, because uh, this seems like a critical moment. Thanks, Phil. 
Uh, Chairman Scripps. Thanks, Doug. Um, so we've been busy. Um, the a number of orders at the Public Service Commission. Uh, last month, we finalized the um, integrated resource plan planning parameters, which we are required to revisit every five years, along with the filing requirements. And there's a lot of work there around aligning um, what the utilities file as part of their long term energy plans with the MISO futures, uh, greater modeling and consideration of storage and analysis of generation diversity uh, and trying to line up at least in terms of understanding what it would be uh, if the, the utilities were then to, to meet the targets laid out in the My Healthy Climate Plan. So I'm not sure still that we can require um, that the utilities meet those, but I, I think that we can and we included in the filing requirements that they model what it would look like if they did. And uh, I think that gives greater transparency uh, and planning. Uh, we recently approved a rate case uh, for DTE Electric Company, um, and there were some big headlines coming out of it. But, but as part of that, there were a number of interesting pilots that I just wanted to flag, including uh, non-wires alternative that will help in integrating distributed energy resources, a lithium-ion battery project that will replace a diesel peaking plant, a pay-as-you-save uh, approach for electric buses and rebates for electric vehicle charging infrastructure, among a number of other things. Brandon talked about the Consumers Energy IRP, uh, so I'll, I'll skip that. Um, but then we also have been working around the um, Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. Uh, we're one of a handful of states that have required the utilities to submit and then on a biennial basis to sort of come back and report their efforts to, to draw down and leverage some of the, the dollars available um, at the federal level and how those could potentially offset or uh, expand the utilization of, of uh, their customer dollars in terms of building out some of the, the projects that are funded under the IIJA. Um, we've also been busy in a sort of strange way for the commission on, on grants and reports. We aren't typically a grants making organization, but we have been charged with a low carbon energy infrastructure uh, grant program that was authorized by the legislature and funded uh, to the tune of $50 million. Currently have an RFP uh, window open for that and um, have provided some guidance as part of that RFP process. I think it closes early in the in the new year and then we'll, re we'll review what we've gotten. Um, we also were charged by the legislature with uh, taking a, a deep dive into renewable natural gas and its potential in Michigan. I think it helps to inform the debate around some of the alternatives, uh, particularly on the gas side. Uh, and the legislature also recently charged us um, to conduct a future of nuclear energy in, in Michigan, including um, both some of the, the traditional uses and then some of the emerging um, things like uh, small modular reactors. And that report is just getting underway. And then beyond uh, the sort of work of the commission, uh, we've been fairly active at the RTO level uh, with MISO and the long range transmission planning, which was approved earlier this year. Tranche one is $10.3 billion, the largest ever investment in, in transmission and will help to support 53,000 megawatts of new renewable energy. So the numbers, both in terms of cost, uh, but also benefits, and then ultimately, the 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 potential uh, in integrating new uh, carbon free resources is really significant as we try and get our arms around the transition. And then just to brag about my colleagues for a bit, um, some really great national leadership. Um, so uh, Commissioner Phillips has been active uh, chairing the the NARU commission or committee on telecommunications and um, and some of the uh, energy telecom uh, overlap. And, and we see his leadership at the state as well in terms of his service on the Council on Future Mobility and Electrification. And Catherine Paratek, my other colleague, was recently named the chair of the NARUC um, task force or the working group on, on electric vehicles. So uh, you see them showing up not just in Michigan, but nationally as well. And it's a um, but it's 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 a, a pretty great environment. We're, we're still not carbon regulators, um, but but obviously have an impact on on how the transition uh, unfolds and uh, trying to play our role. Great, thanks, thanks, Chairman. As an outsider, I can, I can uh, easily say that you've got a tremendous commission. Uh, you really do, and something that people in the state should be proud of. You really, really do. I saw Tanya raised her hand, and she's sitting next to Jim. So I'm going to call on both of you at the same time here, and you can uh, decide who goes first. Uh, Tanya, since you raised your hand, you go first. That is efficient moderation, Doug. 
Um, I have a couple of things to report. So one in my big news is that I have submitted my resignation at Nehru, the uh, chair scripts I'm just talking about. My last day will be this Friday. And I am actually leaving to start um, doing work. I'm going to be on my own initially, but I'm uh, working with some partners to focus on supporting decision makers to um, provide meaningful community engagement and decision making. So one of the things that has come up, I've been doing some energy justice work in my current role, and one of the things that comes up consistently, particularly with utility regulators, which is right, who I spend most of my time with, is wanting to have more community involvement in policy making and really having a difficult time figuring out how to bridge the gap between communities that don't have a background in the type of work that commissions do or in the energy industry and commissions who often have certain structural requirements or procedural requirements that they have to follow that may impede the ability for those communities to be engaged. So I'm going to try my hand at working on solutions to that problem, both in supporting the commissions in that work, as well as working with communities to help them better understand how the process works and where opportunities are for involvement. Um, so elevated engagement is my new gig. I'll send the word out to everybody so you have my information. And then the other thing that I'm working on that is more local is um, the there's a small group that received a grant from the Energy Foundation to do some of this specific type of community engagement work. And so we have identified a group of organizations across the state, community organizations to that will be meeting, I think, in the next couple of weeks to talk about a plan to utilize the funding that we've received to help be advocates for affordability, particularly during the energy transition. And I should have noted my focus in my new work will be on you know, what DOE is calling under Justice 40, disadvantaged communities. That is similarly the uh, organizations that we have brought together for this particular engagement work. Um, and so we'll be trying to help provide uh, both collaboration among those organizations, starting with you know, helping them understand again, how to engage, where there are opportunities to advocate and what types of policies would benefit um, them and the people that they serve from an affordability standpoint, and then um, to help kind of develop a toolkit that they can use to share within their communities to try to help spread the word. That money will be used in one of the missing things, I think, in a lot of this community engagement work and particularly in serving disadvantaged communities is providing stipends and fundings, both for people's time, for travel, um, for technology and different things like that. So that is what we will be focusing on is also trying to close that gap and recognize the value of um, having communities actually engage in some of these discussions by appropriately compensating them or maybe not fully appropriately compensating them, but compensating them to some degree um, so that, uh, again, that appropriately recognizes the value that they bring. Great. Congratulations on the new gig. Very, very important work that uh, is very necessary. So good luck with that. Uh, Jim? Oh, thanks. And, and hey, everybody. It's great to see everyone. Um, this is coming from a workforce perspective, naturally, and, and that's an incredibly broad perspective. So there's a lot of waterfront to cover there. And I certainly can't speak for all worker issues. Um, but what I can say is that um, we have been naturally uh, our employer partners like DTE and Consumers Energy and their efforts to reduce their emissions require uh, workforce and, um, participation that we've been working closely with our partners of Consumers Energy uh, on, their, on their efforts as well. We have been very active in weighing in uh, with the Department of Energy on a couple of its uh, grant programs, particularly on the uh, Hydrogen Hub Award uh, from a workforce perspective. What we think is important in um, awarding hubs. We've shared those comments with Eagle, um, as well as we weighed in with the Department of Energy on uh, the uh, transmission facilitation program 
Um, and for workforce perspective on that, we've shared those comments with Eagle as well, an effort to be in alignment with, with um, the climate action plan and understand some of the uh, workforce issues associated with that. Um, I'm, I happen to be on the board of directors for the Workforce Development Institute, which is under the umbrella of the Michigan State FLCIO. Very excited for the work that they are doing under the uh, My Rep Apprenticeship Expansion Program, part of that coalition of folks that are working on that. Um, we provided letters of support for and and um, did a couple of news um, interviews as well to try to keep base load zero generation um, emission free um, and that's zero generation excuse me emission free base load emission free generation going on in Michigan um, and uh, I worked with the governor's office closely on that. Um, we've also I also participate as a stakeholder, provide letters to support for the five downriver communities that were awarded uh, the grant money from I think it was the full community grants um, and part of stakeholder, which was under the leadership of the state treasurer's office and the, and the governor's office as well. Uh, uh, with that work, um, we worked with the, with the uh, Blue Green Alliance. We weighed in heavily on the um, uh, Uncle Ira. Uh, prior to that, uh, and I also participated in a roundtable with the uh, Secretary of Treasury on guidance uh, given to the IRS, particularly on how that might be rolled out in relation to um, the workforce requirements. And under IRA, we petitioned heavily for both workforce standards as well as community benefits being attached to those uh, uh, to that work. Been working heavily and promoting and advocating and trying to improve the standard of living for workers in renewable energy. Um, doing a fair amount of work uh, both in Michigan as well as uh, across the country as far as that's concerned. Um, and then I would also say from a um, international perspective, did some studies, did a study tour of best practice for workforce development for wind. Uh, to have an understanding of where we can collaborate with employers and training for renewable energy. Uh, we currently have an apprenticeship with consumers that is a wind technician, uh, renewable energy specialist, one of the first in the country, uh, wind technician, solar a solar technician, and battery storage all combined into one particular job discipline. Um, so understand what best practices is and delivery platforms for wind technicians. And then working globally as well with uh, other labor unions on uh, both COP uh, as well as pre uh, pre uh, previous to COP in the State Department, giving feedback to the State Department prior to COP 27, as well as other unions on just transition, both in the energy sector as well as the general, the general uh, sector on mobility as well and, and manufacturing and industrial. So, those are a couple of things. I'm happy to answer any questions along the way. Thank, thanks, Jim. A lot going on. That's great. Um, Brandon, you, I'm going to give you another shot here. Do you want to do you want to try to finish up what you what you were you you left off at about uh, uh, the net zero methane you were you were talking yeah. about? Yeah, I turned off my video. Maybe that that'll help my bandwidth. It sounds issues. good. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, so as far as reducing our own emissions, you know, made progress on electric and then also on our methane um, by replacing uh, a lot of aging infrastructure, both for emissions benefit and safety benefit. The next big bucket that we focus on is enabling others. Um, so whether it's large corporate customers like Cynthia mentioned, uh, you know, we work with the state of Michigan, General Motors, others to reduce their own carbon uh, from power purchases through uh, renewable energy voluntary agreements. Uh, we also have um, unregulated subsidiaries of CMS Energy that work with uh, companies like uh, General Motors, Boyne Ski Resorts, and others who want either on-site or off-site renewable energy, we help them navigate um, that those kind of carbon reductions. So a lot of great progress there. Uh, we're also really focused on vehicle electrification, aligned with the governor's goal of, of 2 million electric vehicles. We have our own goal of 1 million in our service territory. And so we have two big programs. One is for residential customers, we call Power My Drive. Uh, that involves a couple of things. It's reducing range anxiety by building out a network of public charging stations all over the state. Uh, so we've already done uh, over 200 level two chargers and about 40 fast chargers, uh, working closely with Eagle and others, uh, DTE and others to place them in strategic spots on Michigan's highways and have plans to do more of that. Um, we also really are trying to lean into the fact that 
uh, we're sort of a trusted energy resource for our customers by providing um, a lot of customer information about what it's like to own an EV, whether that's total cost of ownership, how you can get a charger for your home, referring you to a local electrician, really making it easy for the next um, generation of folks that are going to buy an EV that aren't the early adopters. Um, uh, and so that's that's a big piece of it. Likewise, we do similar work with fleets. We're working with about 50 fleets around Michigan, including the state of Michigan, to help identify business case for transitioning to fleet electrification and understanding the infrastructure needs that fleet owners will need to put charging infrastructure in. Um, so a lot of work there. We're also working on decarbonizing our customer emissions from gas. We have a net zero customer goal by 2050 uh, for our scope three emissions from our gas system aligned with the governor's goal, uh, including a 20% customer reduction by 2030. So a big piece of that this decade is going to be continuing to focus on energy efficiency. Uh, we've got a big focus in the next year on energy justice and low income energy efficiency. Uh, we've got a targeted program in Flint where we're uh, working with agencies to create some innovative approaches to break down some of the barriers to energy efficiency uh, adoption in low income communities. Um, we're also we worked with the MPSC to, to get approved a new voluntary program for customers that want to use forestry offsets uh, from a Michigan forestry project to reduce or eliminate their carbon footprint from heating their home. So excited about that. And then continue to work on renewable natural gas. We've got, we made a major announcement with Swiss Lane Farms, a big dairy operation in West Michigan about working together to leverage the methane emissions from dairy farms um, and put those, to, uh, eliminate those by turning them into renewable natural gas. So a lot of exciting work on decarbonizing the gas system in the building sector, um, as well as work on resiliency. Dan mentioned, you know, we're working with the commission to invest really a, over a billion dollars a year to uh, clear trees. We're doing some strategic undergrounding. We're really upgrading and rebuilding our, our electric system to be more resilient to more extreme weather and wind that we're seeing um, as a result of climate change. Um, looking forward this year, um, continuing to execute on the IRP, uh, continuing the just transition work that we have when we retire our existing coal units, working with uh, Jim and the UWA, as well as the communities to care for the workers in the communities and also clean up those sites. And then a big focus on building out solar and storage, as I mentioned, as well as on affordability. You know, we're seeing commodity prices increase, both natural gas and electricity prices increase. We have a number of our residential customers who are um, either below poverty level or asset limited income constrained. Uh, so, you know, just one um, job loss or car crash or healthcare incident away from really struggling. And so we're really leaning into energy efficiency, bill and payment assistance programs to make sure that um, everybody who needs assistance in paying their energy bills this winter uh, has access to that. So that's a lot on our agenda but aligned Great. with the plan. Thank, thanks, Brandon, appreciate it. Um, we've got two minutes left in this uh, segment. I don't know if either, um, I'm, I'm looking at my list. Um, Frank, you're in the room, I think. Um, I don't know if Frank's not in the room, okay. Um, how about, um, let's see, how about Darrell? Can you all hear me? Uh, barely, maybe a little closer. We try to get a little closer. Sorry, there we got go. some. That's good. Okay, there we go. Hey, uh, everyone. So yeah, uh, in terms of uh, my work over the, the course of this year, um, actually some of that has been mentioned uh, in uh, my involvement. So my involvement uh, as an advocate with uh, NRDC, Natural Resources Defense Council, uh, being involved in those cases that chair uh, chair scripts and uh, um, Brandon uh, mentioned the consumers IRP and the uh, recently passed uh, 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 rate case uh, DT uh, DT rate case um, there, but um, continuing to involve uh, be involved in uh, intervening in these cases at the the commission and different stakeholder uh, events um, and work groups that are that the commission's been holding on um, a variety of topics. I am pretty heavily involved in their uh, low income policy board, which, you know, I provide the perspective also not only thinking about affordability, but thinking about as we're transitioning uh, this clean energy transition, how do we do it in the most affordable uh, way? So spending a lot of time there 
um, upcoming casework, uh, working involved uh, in the DTIRP with the same goals of the other cases, trying to uh, transition, uh, uh, obviously transition as uh, to clean energy as, as quickly as possible. It's part of the, the process there. Um, and I'm looking forward a lot of uh, what I've been doing and a lot of, I know a lot of groups are starting to do to kind of plan out the priorities for next year. Um, a lot of those priorities align with the, the Mild Climate Plan. So how do we take a lot of the uh, the, the great uh, pieces that are part, part of that plan, for example, like the RPS, you know, what is what do the steps look like um, to start to look at making that a reality? Um, not, not with this new reality that we have in terms of the new legislature composition, um, just kind of wrapping my head and uh, wrapping our heads around what those look like there. So um, I think that all is, uh, that's, that all uh, is going to boil down to a pretty busy year. I think we all uh, know that. Um, doing a lot of thinking um, around how can we maximize these federal dollars for um, building, weather, uh, building weatherization uh, envelope uh, improvements. Um, still looking at how can we make uh, electrification work in Michigan, particularly um, heat pumps. Some of those low uh, low hanging fruits. Uh, fruits it looks like uh, transitioning from some of those fossil fuels like propane to heat pumps. Those are uh, areas that we've been exploring. Actually working with uh, consumers and DT and, and uh, trying to fix, figure out a way to make those work uh, in Michigan. So a lot of work uh, happening there um, and going forward. Uh, looking into 2023. Uh, putting my other hat on uh, for other for, for folks who don't know, I'm also, also serve as a county commissioner in Ingham County. Actually, coming on the, off the commission, but um, we passed a uh, a climate goal of uh, being carbon neutral by uh, 2040 uh, last year. So that uh, there's been a commission that's been stood up to figure out how can local government, at least particularly Ingham County, um, do to lower its emissions, and we hired a um, a firm to do an energy audit on um, the majority of our buildings to lower our emissions there, and also doing uh, exploring how can uh, Ingham County can leverage some of those federal dollars to uh, make houses in Ingham County more affordable, uh, efficient, you know, all the things that we've been talking about um, with this council. So, um, but there'll be a lot of work there uh, going forward, but just really happy uh, to go into, uh, I guess, 2023 with some momentum. Great. Thanks, Darrell. And thanks to everybody. Great, yeah. great uh, discussion. Everybody is incredibly busy. That's fantastic. So great to hear about all the work that's going on. And let me turn it back to Corey. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Uh, that's pretty that pretty much is a wrap. The, the only few items I have is that our next meeting um, is scheduled for February 28th. Uh, You'll be able to find meeting materials and other resources at michigan.gov.gov backslash climate per usual. Uh, and then you can email any thoughts or comments as follow up to eagle, e g l e dash climate solutions at michigan.gov for the folks who are participating and just listening in. And I think the folks at the council uh, know how to get a hold of us. So uh, thank you all. Really do appreciate it. Um, and good to see that I'm going to give a special shout out to folks who are in person. It's nice to see people in person. So, um, but thanks all. Have a, have a great day. That's right.